Pat, I need you to, Pat, you need to unmute. Start again. Start again, please. Okay. Sounds like my mic was not working adequately. So I'll start again and say good evening, ladies and gentlemen, to each and every one of you. We're glad that you have chosen to join us tonight. Um, the community forum for the third district council seat is going to begin. And I am Pat Butler, the president of the local league, and I'm pleased to be here tonight to start this forum. In addition to the virtual forum, we have live streaming on channel 21, cable channel 21, and we're also live streaming what? I'm sorry, it appears that Pat's having some difficulty with her microphone right now. Okay, Pat. Pat, you are on mute. So you know what's happening okay we can hear you now oh you can okay <laughs> yes so perhaps um i cannot see you but i will go ahead with greeting you all and welcoming you to the forum and again apologizing for whatever technical difficulties have um have been, have been sieging us uh this is the community forum hosted by the League of Women Voters for the third district city council seat. I am Pat Butler, the current president of the Woodland League. And tonight it's an honor to be here with you. I'm glad that so many of you have come to join this forum. Um, we will also have live streaming on Woodland Cable Channel 21 and on our League Facebook page. So if somebody would care to join there, that's available to you. Um, we will be recording this forum and it will be available on the League website as well as on YouTube. The opportunity to, to ask direct questions to the applicants during this forum is available only to you, you the, the current audience. And those questions can be um, submitted during the first half of the forum. On a lighter note, the League really wishes to thank the Daily Democrat for its coverage of this event, Channel 31, 21, excuse me, for the um, broadcasting that they're doing tonight and the technical assistance from Woodlands Tech, Technical Department. And especially you, our audience, for viewing this forum from all the platforms that we do have available. Tonight, you've got a unique opportunity to hear from the applicants, although you will not be voting for them, you will certainly be able to ask questions of them. And later, you can also ask questions of your city council members and or questions at the next um, city council meeting on the 19th of January. And now it's my pleasure to introduce to you our forum moderator, Carla Cox, who is our director of voter education. Thank you very much and enjoy your evening. Good evening. And um, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm looking forward to hearing the responses from all of our um, uh, speakers tonight. Um, I'm, as Pat said, I'll be acting as the moderator tonight. 
And although this is a virtual forum, we will be following the same basic agenda that we use when we hold in-person forums. So we will be starting with opening statements from each applicant. Um, then we will have three questions that were posed by the league. We'll follow with a five minute break to uh, prepare for the public questioning. Um, and then we'll have the questions from the public. We'll have closing statements from the applicants and then wrap it up. Um, all of the applicants will have the opportunity to answer each of the questions and the order of the speakers will rotate. So um, now I'm going to uh, go over the guidelines for our questions. And we, we're using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. I think on most screens it's at the bottom. Um, and we will not be using chat. So chat is not part of this. Please use the Q&A if you would like to submit a question. Um, you may submit your question through the Q&A at any time before the five minute break. And then at that time, we'll stop taking questions so that we can hear the responses to the questions that have come in. We have league mem members who will be acting as our question sorters. And once the questions have come in, they will select the questions for the applicants according to the league guidelines, which I'm now going to review. So all applicants in this case will have the opportunity to respond to each question. The time limit for responses uh, in, for the questions will be one and a half minutes for each candidate. And those will be strictly enforced by the timekeeper. We ask that you keep your questions brief and that they relate to the issues involved with this office, the city council seat that's being sought. Negative remarks, rudeness, or profane language is not allowed. Questions that appear to attack a particular candidate will not be used. Questions will be submitted using Q&A, not the chat feature, remember, at any time before the break. Please ask only one question per Q&A entry. Questions submitted prior by public to, uh, prior by the public um, to the forum will be included for consideration. I do not believe we received any, so all the questions will be coming in, in during this uh, forum. Now we have uh, two or more th league members who will act as the question sorters after all the questions have been submitted and they will follow these guidelines. Similar questions will be combined if appropriate to avoid duplication. Questions will be chosen that cover a variety of topics. If there are a number of questions, the question by a majority of attendees will be prioritized. And there, there may not be sufficient time for all questions. We've allowed uh, an hour and a half for this forum. I'm hoping that we can get to most of, if not all of the questions that come in. And the moderator will we read one question at a time so that all may hear it. And then at that time, I'll indicate who will be starting first in the order that the questions will be answered. Okay, so now let's move on to the opening statements. Okay, so each candidate here will have be able to make a two minute opening statement in alphabetical order. We're gonna start with Mr. Timothy Blank, Mr. Terry East, Ms. Tara Figueroa, and Ms. Tanya Garcia Cade. Uh, Bobby Harris is not able to be here tonight um, and he did not submit an opening uh, statement. However, when we get to the lead questions, uh, I will be reading uh, written responses that he submitted. So, Mr. Uh, Blank, if you would like to begin. Thank you. Uh, good evening. My name is Timothy Blank. My wife, uh, Sue, and I purchased our house in the third district of Woodland in 2008 during the housing crisis. We uh, bought a foreclosed fixer upper, as that was all we could afford at the time. Prior to that, we lived in an apartment in Davis, and originally we both came from the Bay Area. I graduated from uh, UC Davis in uh, 
uh, with a degree in entomology. That's a study of insects uh, in 2005 and later earned a master's degree in horticulture and agronomy from UC Davis. My wife and I have two daughters, Rachel, who's 11, and Elizabeth, who's three. Uh, we've homeschooled Rachel throughout her childhood and plan to do the same for Elizabeth. I work for a, a nonprofit organization called the California Crop Improvement Association, which is affiliated with the plant science department at UC Davis. My work primarily involves cooperating with seed companies to conduct seed certification services. As an example of what I do, everyone here has seen all the hybrid sunflower production around Yolo County. All of those fields are inspected by our office and program to ensure that those fields meet uh, seed quality standards. I also sit on two research committees at the university and conduct audits of seed facilities throughout the state. On the civic side, uh, I'm a board member of the nonpartisan Yolo County Taxpayers Association, as I believe local government should be accountable and effectively use our taxpayer money. On a personal side, I'm an avid bicyclist, and in, and in the normal year, I commute between Woodland and Davis on bicycle. I enjoy gardening and have advocated for water conservation. My Xeriscaped front yard was one of the featured properties during Woodland's Waterwise uh, tour. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. And now, um, Mr. Terry East. Um, can you please unmute? That was a great start. I wanted to thank the League of Women Voters for this opportunity to have meet the candidates and putting on a, a great forum. Um, I personally am a fourth generation woodlander with a family history of service to the city. Uh, when I move around the city, I'm reminded of many childhood experiences. Uh, I feel a deep connection and can't help wanting to give back to the city. For the past five years since my return from the Silicon Valley, I have served on various boards, committees, and service organizations dedicated to moving woodland into a new phase working on projects with the goal of improving economic inclusion and sustainability, improve the literacy rate, develop its workforce, celebrate its rich agricultural heritage, and produce the gala for the reopening of the state theater and annual events like the Christmas tree lighting and concerts in the Heritage Plaza. It's, I, I, I believe it is a deep swath of uh, satisfying work and experience that develop a, a more of a deep understanding of how the city works. I have an MBA in finance from National University um, and my professional career has been in primarily in business development and the tech world. You know, over a span of more than two decades, I facilitated and participated on cross-functional teams, developing what's next at organizations ranging from a large Fortune 100 corporation to two internet startups and various small and medium businesses. It is my desire to continue working to ensure Woodland provides a high quality of life for our residents. If we take care of the least able in our community, the benefit will cover all. It is a tremendous honor to serve the third district if selected. Thank you. And uh, next, uh, Tara Figueroa. And please unmute. Okay, hello. Um, so I'm Tara. Um, I am a Woodland native, born, raised. Um, this is my second time living over in District 3. Um, most recently, I've been here currently for five years, and it's um, been quite awakening seeing a lot of the issues that we face over here. Um, my background does include working for small businesses. Um, I do also run a home-based business, but maintain a full-time job as well. Um, I have worked in property management, real estate, and the agriculture industry, um, which is very home to Woodland. 
Um, through these experiences, I've been able to see the direct impacts and hardships the city and county decisions have affected local businesses and its constituents, um, specifically relating to the crime, homeless, and affordable housing. Um, so as far um, just to know about me, um, I, I love this town. Um, like I said, I'm born and raised here. Um, it's very personal for me to get involved. Um, I want nothing best for the city, for its constituents. And I think that it's really important that everyone's decisions are being taken into consideration and everyone's opinions. And that we're not just following along with a certain narrative that's being pushed. Okay, thank you. Um, next, um, Ms. Um, Tanya Gar Garcia Cadena. Hello, good evening. And uh, thank you for this opportunity. Um, so I wanna start with letting everyone know that in 2018, I stepped up and I ran for the third district city council seat. I walked door to door. I spoke with concerned citizens. I attended candidate meet and greets and nearly 1000 voters in this district voted for me. And I'm confident that with the work that I've done since then that I would actually garner more votes if this were to go to an election. Um, I'm ready to hit the ground running. I have the skills necessary to be a competent leader and I will outwork anyone at this position. A little background on me. Um, I have lived in district three for 25 years. Uh, four generations of my family has called Woodland home. I've been a small business owner, a nonprofit leader and a community activist. Um, I was a founding member of the Woodland Schools Foundation and we, I served as president for 10 years we raised over half a million dollars for the students, uh, student programs in our district. I am fiscally responsible and I have a reputation for getting things done and under budget. I've served on um, two city commissions, the Child Care Commission and the Parks and Rec Commission. And I also served on the Budget Advisory Council for Woodland Joint Unified School District where we oversaw a budget of over $75 million. Um, uh, the city of Woodland presented me with a community service award and Woodland Community College presented me with their Founders Day Award for a distinguished alumni. I'm a leader who listens to concerns, looks for answers and seeks resolution in a timely manner. Woodland's facing some difficult issues, some of which we will be discussing tonight. I'm ready to take on these challenges and serve this community as your next Woodland City Council member for District 3. Thank you. All right, thank you. Okay, well, we're going to be, um, Mr. Harris did not submit an opening statement. So we will go ahead and move on now to the three lead questions. Our first question, oh, and I will mention that the time allotment for each uh, applicant to respond is one and a half minutes each. So the first question is, what can the city do to assist local individuals and businesses who have suffered economically from the pandemic while balancing the budget? And we'll start with um, Mr. East and uh, Ms. Figueroa, then Ms. Garcia Cadena. I will read Mr. Harris's statement and then Mr. Blank. So starting with Mr. East. Mr. East, can you please unmute? There we go. All okay. right. That's okay. I see six things the city can do in order to help with individuals who are suffering damage from the pandemic. One is I think that Woodland can ensure that uh, the people of Woodland are in the queue for their, their fair share of the $14 billion that Governor Newsom is putting up for recovery specifically businesses, um, as well as uh, small uh, or families 
uh, it to, uh, ensure that there's a quality or, or people that qualify for Medicare, they expect 14% of the or growth in the Medicare program, but make sure that we have the Medicare coverage. Um, you know, work with the county to ensure that we are have we have an equitable distribution of property taxes. Property taxes were rural percentages were set during the 70s and it hasn't been changed since and it's not fair to Woodland. And that would relieve a lot of the budget balancing issues. Um, for consider using a portion of the increase in sales tax to uh, it, develop for community development. Um, five, uh, community service to assist citizens locate nonprofit assistance and food distribution. And six, communicate, communicate, communicate. Okay, thank you. And Ms. Figueroa. So for me personally, um, this question is very misleading. Um, it disregards what the city could have done after the onset of the pandemic as an autonomous local government. Local individuals and businesses did not have to suffer economically as they did as, they did as a result of the city not questioning the science or the motives behind the county. At the beginning, the coronavirus was very much an unknown threat, and I think that we can all agree on that. However, as more information became or came available from multiple sources, not just the county, it became obvious that the city could have been proactive in helping individuals stay healthy and helping businesses stay economically viable. The stop, start, stop, start, moving the goalposts, policies dished out by the state and rubber stamped by the county are not based on science or data driven. Not once has the county health department provided the actual low numbers of active cases per day in real time. This is on purpose because the county has monetized the virus as has the state. The mandates were and are discriminatory against local small businesses. So what can the city do in the discriminatory mandates as an autonomous local government has the right to do? But the city can't continue to make other processes like getting permits even more challenging than under normal circumstances. Thank you. Ms. Uh, Ms. Garcia Cadena. Thank you. So um, assistance with economic recovery from the pandemic is going to be crucial for our community. Outreach to our most vulnerable citizens to ensure that their mental health and basic needs are being met should be a priority. 211 is an underutilized service that can link community members with vital health and human services. Encouraging the use of the 211 Yolo County phone service would be a means of providing assistance to everyone. And this information could be dispersed using the city's social media pages, as well as including a flyer with the water bill. Uh, the governor's proposed budget includes two items that are especially helpful to our economy recovery. Uh, first is $2.4 billion for an additional $600 state payment to the lower income workers, with the goal of increasing consumer spending that will ultimately create local revenue, hopefully. The second is a $575 million uh, small business nonprofit grants. Providing assistance with grant applications for small businesses is going to be a key factor. Many are barely hanging on, working 60 plus hours a week, trying to keep their businesses afloat. The time and energy it takes to complete a grant application might hinder their opportunity to apply. Assisting the owners with the grant writing process is imperative. The city should partner with the Chamber of Commerce to recruit volunteer grant writers to help with this process. Okay, thank you. Next um, in the order is um, Mr. Harris. And so I will be reading the um, uh, statement, his response to this question that he submitted. Okay, I'll begin now. Our city budget is surely in great flux due to the effects of pandemic. Fortunately, the Democrats are now largely in charge federally and statewide so local agencies will soon see long due relief. 
This new and badly needed relief will include various provisions, especially for businesses. Our city should help our local businesses to matriculate into these provisions. Outreach programs to these local businesses will be crucial for this task. Perhaps use of the city business license database would be a good approach with a government reduced postage plan. City staff might need to be expanded or enhanced to meet this task. City staff might also want to consider presenting a plan to the council about temporarily reducing city fees and other city related costs essentially repaid by increased collection of sales tax revenue. Our Chamber of Commerce should be willing, enlisted, to play a key role in such an effort, perhaps sponsoring business relief information workshops. Our city must boost its sales tax money by helping to pull our local businesses out of these cruel effects of pandemic. Our city and its businesses exist in ultimate synergy. And that's the, that was Mr. Harris's statement. So next, um, Mr. Blank. Thank you. The quarter cent sales tax, Measure R, was passed in the last election uh, to replace Measure J, which was sunsetting. The current associated advisory measure uh, directs 55% of the $2.8 million to be collected annually uh, towards youth programs and only 5% on subsidies to assist low-income families and seniors. I believe that at least temporarily, the city council should use its discretionary authority to adjust these ratios and direct the majority of this uh, sales tax revenue to assist both in individuals and businesses that have been hardest hit economically by the pandemic. Uh, we also need to listen to the voices of small businesses and be receptive to working with them to reopen their doors and bring back local jobs, which is ultimately the only way uh, we're going to get out of this. Thank you. All right. Thank you to everyone for your responses to our first question. We're going to move on now to question number two from the league. So please discuss Woodland's general plan, including acres still to be developed, the number of affordable and multiple family dwellings required, and plans to maintain necessary infrastructure. So we'll be starting with Ms. Figueroa. As I mentioned before, the three most important issues for the city right now are crime, the homeless, and affordable housing. I will talk about affordable housing right now and how it relates to the general plan, specifically District 3. Affordable housing is essentially non-existent in Woodland. There are certain apartment communities classified as affordable housing or Section 42. However, to qualify for such housing is nearly impossible. I have personally worked at a few of these communities and have seen the manipulation and tactics used to qualify or recertify for residents. Many have greater income than the certifiable amount allowed. This cheating takes away from those who truly need these programs, those who cannot afford basic needs while being forced to pay astronomical rental rates. This is the city's fault. One example of not making available affordable housing specific to District 3 is the Kentucky Avenue corridor, corridor and SP3 that was essentially brushed aside in the development of the general plan so that the sprawl in the Spring Lake specific plan growth area could progress. The city has a reputation of not being transparent and putting personal favors and political affiliations before the need of residents. Also, District 3 is very much at the center of the flood wall issue, but representation from the dis district in favor of outside developers has lacked. Far less expensive and far more effective solutions to mitigate flood concerns have been grossly overlooked. The Flood Control Advisory Committee was formed to railroad developer projects at the expense of the city, state, and federal coffers. Thank you. Um, next, uh, Ms. Garcia-Cadena. Thank you. 
the 2035 general plan was developed with a vision of providing our community members with a vibrant, thriving city where they can work, live, and enjoy their prosperous community. The need for slow, compact, sustainable growth is key to maintaining our small town feel. With the maximum growth calling for up to 7,000 new residential units, the city needs to prioritize infill and residential growth along the West Main Street corridor and downtown. High density affordable housing is necessary to meet the growing needs of Woodland. Affordable housing specific to seniors is also needed. Completing the Spring Lake area development is a priority. And one way to preserve current affordable housing units is to work collaboratively with unit owners to utilize available state and federal financial sources. When it comes to growth in Woodland, we need to protect our small town feel by being careful and thoughtful in how we grow. And we can achieve this through efforts guided by Woodland residents and through a public process. Okay, thank you. And uh, next I will read Mr. Harris's response. About general plan and land use issues. Our city has quite a huge problem. Under political pressure from big housing developers, it has refused to properly implement Woodland's Urban Line Limit Line Act of 2006, our city's bedrock planning document. Just examine the general plans. Goal section, the city council drew the basic line, but it has ignored its clear and key responsibilities to implement the affordable housing provisions of the act the essential land use balance for drawing this line. This voter initiative amendment of the General Plan Act requires specific actions by the city council regarding zoning and constant evaluation of increased residential densities. The city council has plainly failed to accomplish the voters clear will and our city is thus suffering unlawful and adverse development essentially forever. Just look at North Natomas where economical small lot development is flourishing, allowing community equity for many citizens to realize how far behind is Woodland. Our city planning staff tried very hard to accomplish such housing reform, but the council has long been in the pocket of big developers. Our new prospective development at the Southern boundary is at risk because of this huge problem. This is the most important reason that I should be appointed being the legal and political champion of this local cause. Okay, and so our next um, speaker will be Mr. Timothy Blank. The general plan outlines numerous properties throughout Woodland where there is opportunity for infill. Outside of Spring Lake, the last updated general plan tallies 34 acres of vacant or redevelopable residential land within the city limits and an additional 154 acres of vacant or underutilized properties where existing zoning allows for housing. In addition to this, the plan out outlines over 3,000 acres of land for potential development outside of the city limits but within the urban line. The problem in Woodland is not availability of land to build affordable housing. One major deterrent to development is the high permitting fees with relation to our economic position here in Woodland. Business activity and construction projects are stifled because of the high fees which must be paid up front. Let's reduce those fees or at least let them be paid over a long period of time. Additionally, Woodland is not a primary market for lenders. It's hard to get loans to build. The city needs to work with potential developers to both secure financing from funding sources and make it economical to construct new housing projects, including affordable housing. All right, thank you. Thank you to everyone for your responses. Um, ah, next we have um, Mr. East. Thank you. So the, the general plan that was written almost 10 years ago basically focused on the Spring Lake property area or development area. It recognized that there were 406 acres to develop 
And at this point, there's probably close to, you know, less than 20% left to be developed. Um, it, our regional share of low income housing was slated at 664 low housing units um, with a total of like 1900 of all income levels. And then the infrastructure maintenance um, costs are covered by the capital improvement plan, enterprise revenues, and franchise fees. So I guess I've answered the, the basic question. The problem is, is that none of that really is applicable to the, dist the third district. If you look what's happening in the third district, the the, the number of people who are living in homes, the density in, in homes and single family homes is overcrowded. You have two and three families in a lot of the homes um, because they can't afford rent. Uh, there's no, there isn't adequate housing in the area. Most of the third district is classified as being low to medium density. Uh, it's, it's, so there is really no plan outside of maybe some of the, the, the they have a plan to do some, oh, I'm out of time, sorry. All right. Thank you to everyone. And I appreciate how everyone is being very respectful of the time limits. That, that's very helpful and very courteous. Thank you. So um, we'll move on to the third question from the league. What steps should Woodland take to reduce carbon emissions from industrial, residential, and commercial buildings? both in the short term and long term. And we'll start with Ms. Garcia Cadena. Thank you. So I've been doing um, a lot of research on this area and found a study published by Environmental Science and Technology very helpful. They noticed specific, specific steps that cities can take to reduce their carbon emissions. And Woodland has already implemented quite a few of them. Uh, installation of smart meters, increasing electric car charging stations, and investing in electric public transportation. Now, as our city grows, we should look to make our public transportation system more convenient and increase the service level. Of course, the question then becomes, how do we encourage people to use it? And my answer is for city officials and staff to set the example. If city employees and elected officials utilize public transportation, and encourage coworkers, friends, and families to do the same. Studies have shown that the general public is more apt to do so as well. Increasing our urban tree canopy is another step that the city can take to decrease carbon emissions. In March of 2019, the city council approved an urban forest master plan. Key goal is to increase shade tree coverage to reach 25% by 2035. As of 2017, Woodlands canopy was measured at 14%. To date, over 5,500 trees have been planted by the Woodland Tree Foundation. Our city's climate action plan targets the 25% tree coverage as a means of reducing the electricity demands for air conditioning as well as absorbing carbon dioxide. I'm gonna run out of time. We need to work with our industrial and farming neighbors to promote um, wind generation more practical. And I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you. Okay. Um, and uh, I'll read Mr. Uh, Harris's uh, response to this question next. Carbon emissions should be reduced through whatever means are reasonably available. I want to pitch an idea, now about ripe. By the way, I have not owned or operated a motor vehicle for 30 years. I walk a lot, carrying weight. This is healthy behavior and should be civically promoted. I am approximately 69. My idea is that Davis is the bike capital, so let's make Woodland the bicycle trailer capital. Promoting use of bicycles demands consumer convenience, similar to a car trunk, where largest possessions can be put. Getting our citizens away from their motor vehicles and into a variously healthier lifestyle must be accomplished to a reasonable degree. Let's make Woodland the capital of bike trailers in great and interesting synergy with our sister city, Davis, the capital of bikes. Woodland has immense and available technical and practical experience and industrial land 
to achieve this great civic goal, but as yet, no city council leadership. There now exists a good market for this environmental cause, I truly believe, after following it for many years. I am very happy to lead this city and business effort. Okay. Uh, next, uh, Mr. Blank. Thank you. California has among the most ambitious carbon emissions regulations in the United States with the goal of being carbon neutral by 2045. In Yolo County, the Yolo Solano Air Quality Management District already has regulations in place to reduce carbon emissions. Oftentimes, air quality regulations suppress economic growth, which is why they can be so controversial. At the city level, we need to be focusing on win-win strategies that help businesses, the city, and the environment. In downtown Woodland, there are acres of flat rooftops, most without solar panels. Also, there are many warehouses on the east side of uh, the city with flat roofs. The city should explore options to provide or help secure loans for solar panels and small wind turbines. Uh, if the city provides loans, it could receive income from the loans while saving businesses energy costs. Alternatively, the city could lease the roof space from landowners. Uh, that's just one idea, um, but there's, there's certainly many. It's a big question, but uh, I only had a minute and a half. Thank you. Thank you. And Mr. East. Thank you. Reducing the use of energy by buildings, houses, industrial, commercial, uh, could reduce the carbon um, footprint or slash it by 80% by uh, 2050. Uh, what can be done is retrofit uh, uh, efficient construction of the buildings and uh, uh, program efficient use of energy. So in other words, climate control software to, to manage the use of energy and using sustainable energy sources like solar panels, um, and whatnot to reduce the amount of hydrocarbons. The, what the city can do is lo locate grants to fund incentives for energy improvement, um, educate and encourage lifestyle changes in energy conservation, build and encourage developing uh, sustainable energy sources, and require an, an annual energy usage uh, pl public plat or reporting from the industry, um, and then also, you know, maintaining the urban forest and actually perhaps growing uh, rooftop gardens to scrub the environment as well. All right. Thank you very much, um, Ms. Figueroa. This is another question that is intended to mislead those listening here. Energy efficiency and sustainability is addressed in the general plan. There is a 2035 climate action plan included in that, but at this time, the more immediate concerns are crime and homelessness. I do wanna talk about those later. That said, I did mention the need for affordable housing. This includes the need for more multi family residential buildings. Oddly, City Council approved the Woodland Research and Technology Park in Spring Lake area when there is much unused, unimproved land in the existing industrial zone. This technology hub actually mimics already planned areas at UC Davis and the City of Davis. This zoning contradicts many elements in the Climate Action Plan and elements within Chapter 7 of the General Plan and removes opportunities for more multifamily residential buildings in the Spring Lake area. The Research and Technology Park 
was the blatant attempt to appease outside developed interest in the East Area Flood Zone at the expense and sustainability, conservation, and open space policies. Look at who supported this idea. The same people who falsely claimed they supported saving prime farmland. They didn't want houses in SP1A because houses took prime farmland, but they love the idea of putting industrial buildings there. This is not sustainable planning. All right, thank you. All right. Um, thank you all. Again, I appreciate everyone's respect for the time limits. And that is, concludes our league's three questions. We are now at our five minute break and um, at, we will all take a little break. And then after that, we will be um, reading out the questions from the public. So um, thank you.
Welcome back. Um, we're through with our break and ready for our questions from the public. Um, we'll, uh, looking at the order of rotation, uh, I believe we're back at this order, Timothy Blank, Terry East, Tara Figueroa, and Tanya uh, Garcia Cadena. Does that sound right to everybody? <laughs> okay, so uh, our first question is the Woodland City Council has shown supporting recently for DA Jeff Reisig's proposal for diverting individuals with substance abuse or mental health issues from incarceration to treatment opportunities. What is your opinion? Okay, so we'll start with Mr. Blank. Well, I'll start that I, I really like Jeff Isaac and, and I respect his opinion. Um, I, as far as diverting people from incarceration to uh, treatment options, um, that's, there's going to be a, a, a lot of um, unsuccesses for the few successes that, that happen. Um, I suppose it should be tried where at their discretion um, as we can't have our jails filled up. Uh, but uh, I would, I would uh, put it in the discretion of, of the DA. Thank you. Very well, thank you. Okay, uh, next we have uh, Mr. East. Thank you. I recognize the, the issues that the DA is trying to resolve. Um, he's trying to fix problems that, that were created by Prop 47, where we have repeat offenders that are released and they reoffend as and many of them are affected by mental health and drug addiction we have a habit of trying to fix bad legislation with more legislation if if, if ab 47 wasn't in effect uh, the ab or sorry prop 47 ab 1810 gave judges the discretion uh, people who are being um, charged with a crime of whether or not they are going to a prison or they're getting mental health services. I, I, I just think that we have a, a problem with, similar to what we have with AB5, where we have, you know, we have extra complicated, you know, legislation just to compensate for the original bad. All right, thank you. Um, Ms. Figueroa. Um, I really liked what Terry just said um, as far as fixing bad legislation with more legislation. I mean, that just kind of seems to be the common theme, not just throughout Woodland Yellow County, but the state of California. Um, so, um, I, I don't feel diverting people from incarcerations is going to prove to fix anything as right now, everything is already booked and release in Woodland. Um, I deal with this personally with my neighbors I'm surrounded by. I spoke to a sheriff recently who wanted to verify if four people with active warrants were still living two blocks down from me and if I can identify vehicles. I mean, 
Um, I have somebody that is within a couple blocks of me that does have mental health issues that the cops are out here for on a regular basis and his guests have threatened myself as well as other neighbors. So um, that individual to my knowledge has also been given mental health treatment um, because they cannot incarcerate him right now. But at what point does it get to the the line where you're not going to protect your constituents anymore. Um, you know, you do, it becomes a health and safety issue. So um, I, I don't think diverting the incarceration of mental health patients are, is going to resolve anything. It's going to just perpetuate the problem. Okay, thank you. And Ms. Garcia Cadenas, Cadena. Hello, thank you. So um, DA's um, RISE's uh, plan actually has five points and I'll, I'll discuss two of them. One is conservatorship. And I talked about this when I ran a, a couple of years ago. So when people talk about the homeless or the people that are out on the streets committing these crimes, there many mentally ill people are out there as well. And they're unable to care for themselves because of their mental illness and increasing conservatorship opportunities for these people, I think is a is a great plan. I think it's a great idea and it would be extremely helpful. Um, incarcerating those who are uh, committing crimes, uh, I'm sorry, treatment versus incarceration for those who are committing crimes to fuel their drug um, addictions is, it's a um, fairly new idea. And I think that it's something that we need to be looking at what we're doing right now is not working. And there are a lot of people who would benefit from treatment versus incarceration. They don't need a, um, they don't need a criminal record. They need help. And I think um, the DA's plan is a way of getting to that. Thank you. Thank you to all of you. Uh, we're going to uh, move on next to um, question number two. And our order for that for responding will be Mr. East, Ms. Figueroa, Ms. Garcia Cadena, and Mr. Blank. And question number two, what can the council do to involve a broader cross section of the community in civic engagement including those who would not normally voice their views for whatever reason. Mr. East. I think we have a situation where people don't trust government. Um, they don't feel that they have the ear and of uh, the government uh, representatives that when they have things to say that they are placated. Uh, if people have a sense that what they said mattered, then perhaps you would get more involved meant from, from a larger swath of the, citizen, the different demographics within the city. Okay, thank you. Um, Ms. Figueroa. Um, yeah, I feel like I touched on this a little bit in one of my previous answers. Um, as far as just the lack of transparency, um, there is a apparent lack of transparency with the information being shared, how it's being shared, and that uh, it's never what it seems to be at face value. It's always down the road when we actually see the documents or the contracts being constructed that there were outside contractors involved or um, some kind of side deal that benefited somebody. Um, and I feel that full transparency and disclosure is really important. And until that happens, that uh, you're not going to have the public's trust. Um, the public already does not unanimously trust the local government. Um, as we see, 
on a day-to-day -day basis and we see it in our city council and we see in our county and our elected representatives. Um, and I, I feel that the formal process that we do have, although it's respected to our United States and to our country, it's very outdated. And I feel that we need to get more younger people involved. We need to figure out how to get them involved through social media and use the tools and technology that we have to make them more interested and make them want to be able to feel like their voice is being heard and that it does matter. Thank you. Um, Mr. Blank. Um, Mr. Blank has, uh, his screen has, um, Very good. Am I up? Yes, you're up and uh, yes, thank okay, you. I'm sorry, I had a bad internet connection for a bit. I hope this works. Um, can you hear me okay? Y yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, sorry, I missed what everybody else just said. Um, I think we have a big problem in our society in general with apathy amongst the public. Um, I see it more and more. I see it in civic organizations that are aging, failing to get younger blood. People are disinterested in local politics. They're tuning out. That needs to change. How does that change? Um, I think we need to get students involved, especially in high school, get them interested, educate them on our constitution, on the way our government works, encourage them to get involved. Maybe that might help their parents get a little more interested and involved. Um, that's, it's, it's, a, it's a bigger problem than just getting people interested in just the, the, uh, the city council affairs. Uh, we need to, to encourage people at large to really get engaged. And I think that starts with our youth. And uh, so whatever we can do to encourage our schools to get students to be involved, um, that would be very beneficial. Okay, thank you. All right, our third question from the public. Oh, excuse me. Oh, I didn't get a chance to answer. I apologize. I I must have missed up. I apologize. It's your turn. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you. So, um, um, my suggestion would be that we have um, district centric small group meetings where members in specific neighbors neighborhoods could meet with their elected official, um, providing translators for non English speaking residents. Uh, I think that many people aren't even aware of who is on city council. It's it's always very interesting to me when I have conversations and people are kind of surprised that someone is no longer on the council or maybe a, a new member. Um, so keeping, keeping people involved. And also I agree social media, especially for our younger people, getting, getting them involved, the, um, youth activities, helping them coordinate, uh, helping them to get involved and coordinate activities when we eventually open up. Um, we really need to get our youth involved in our community. And from there, you know, they will be productive and, and active citizens. So that's my answer. Thank you. And I apologize for messing up the order there. I will try to do a better job of keeping track here. Okay, we'll move on to our third question. Let's see, get the order here. The third question is, do you have an opinion about and a plan to address illegal fireworks that are set off all year round? 
And we'll start with um, Ms. Figueroa, then Ms. Garcia Cadena, Mr. Blank, and Mr. East. So this is something I think we all kind of personally deal with on a regular basis. Um, I know for myself, um, I'm less than 50 feet away from in either direction from fireworks that go off constantly. I have two small dogs, one with a heart condition. Um, I don't mind it so much, you know, New Year's Eve, 4th of July, but the year round stuff, it, it's gotten out of hand. Um, do I have a plan or opinion? Um, my opinion is it needs to stop. There needs to be consequences. The problem is there is no consequences. And that goes back to what I previously stated with the criminals just being booked and released. If criminals that are vandalizing businesses, breaking into them, doing theft are not having consequences applied to them, people lighting off illegal fireworks know that it's just going to be a warning if they get caught and possibly a fine. Um, I think this is something we need to work with the Woodland Police Department on, and um, we need to figure out a better response to where neighbors can report these people um, anonymously without fear of retaliation, because I think that's a big thing as well. I think a lot of neighbors are fed up with it, but they don't want to be retaliated against if they are caught um, telling on a neighbor. Um, so I think it, it would be a lot of involvement with local law enforcement and encouraging the public to disclose the information, um, but also holding them accountable so it, it discontinues. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Garcia Cadena. Okay. So, uh, so I, I agree with Tara on this. There, there are no consequences. And as far as my opinion, you know, it doesn't bother me so much, but I know that I see on Facebook, it, it bothers a lot of people. And if their children are trying to sleep or they've got, you know, animals that are going wild. Um, you know, as an example, uh, just a couple of years ago, uh, one of my parents, um, their neighbor's tree caught on fire from illegal fireworks and the fire department responded and it was clearly from illegal fireworks and the fire was put out and the, you know, the fire truck left and the people continued with their illegal fireworks. This time they just didn't catch any trees on fire. So there needs to be consequences. There needs to be a way for people to um, report it. You know, I, by the time police law enforcement responds there's really not a lot typically people can get in the house or or have it put away or that type of thing so i think it's a really difficult thing to police but the city should probably look at, at something um addressing it as a, a fire safety issue specifically okay thank you mr blank I see this topic pop up on Nextdoor app, uh, social media, every time something goes off in the neighborhood. And, uh, you know, personally, uh, when when 4th of July, uh, New Year's, it doesn't bother me personally. I, I definitely understand and sympathize, especially with pet owners, um, when we have out of season fire, illegal fireworks. And um, I, I would, concur with the previous uh, speakers that we have laws and they should be enforced. Uh, so I think that's sufficient. It's, it's difficult to enforce. I, I see, um, you know, uh, when I have neighbors doing fireworks, they, they sometimes have scouts to check for cops and they all scramble away when the, when the police come and then they come right back out again. So uh, I, I get it, I see it, uh, I agree laws should be enforced how that to be how is it to be done um i'll leave that to the police officers to figure out thank you and um uh, mr east thank you you know the fireworks are a public nuisance but the there's also another public nuisance as well, and that is people driving on the road or the street, surface streets at, at a high rate of speed in 
cars that have you know a lot you know are allowed um it, it's you know very disruptive it's it, it's uh you know it's an annoyance what the city needs to do is not condone it um and they you know instead of trying to catch everyone that does it perhaps if they were to catch a few and, and, and made it an example of them in terms of enforcing the law that the, the word would get around and this type of behavior would stop Thank you. All right, we'll move on to question number four. What steps will you take to ensure flood protection for North Woodland and our district? And we'll start with Ms. Garcia Cadena, then Mr. Blank, Mr. East, and Ms. Figueroa. So flood protection is something that's been discussed for quite a while in this area. My home was originally in, considered in the floodplain and we were had flood insurance and then we were taken out of the floodplain and don't have flood insurance. And so I think the city needs to re-examine what the, the, current, um, the current policies are and, and work with the, um, what is it, the Conservation Corps to determine what would work best for this area. I don't, I don't, I don't think that a clear answer is out there. There are some homes in the third district that are considered in floodplain, some that are not. Um, you know, the, the dangers of, of a flood are, are certainly going to, at some point, be upon us. So it's it's something that we need to consider. Thank you. Mr. Blank. Like Tanya, uh, when I first moved to my home in, in the third district, I was in the floodplain. It was incredibly expensive insurance. <clears throat> and I'm, I was very grateful to the city for uh, rezoning us and, and uh, magically determining that uh, we're no longer in a floodplain. So uh, thank you to the city uh, planning people who did that. Um, as for what to do, um, I remember when we had the heavy rainfall a couple years ago now, uh, Lower Cache Creek was, was uh, the water levels were right at, the, right at the brim. They were putting out sandbags, if I recall. That, that, uh, that levee, those levees on the sides of, of uh, Cache Creek should be addressed in certain areas uh, to make, potentially raise those up to avert flooding. Um, but uh, again, I would defer to the experts. I don't, I don't have a degree in flood management, so thank you. Thank you. Mr. East. My mom's house was in the floodplain as well for a long time when she lived on Palm. I have no idea why we don't have the ability to create, create or correct the, the cause of the potential for the 100 year flooding or whatever. Maybe it's the railroad tracks, maybe it's some other thing. I have no earthly idea as to why. Uh, you know, it, it, it's it's something that uh, engineers need to work on in terms of the, solving the problem. Thank you, Ms. Figueroa. So um, I did also briefly touch on this um, in the initial questions, and I'll just kind of highlight um, what I had stated previously. Um, but that District 3 is much at the center of the flood wall issue, uh, but representation from this district is in favor of outside developers um, is lacking um, far less expensive and more effective solutions to mitigate flood concerns have been grossly overlooked. 
Um, some of these could be um, considering upstream water diversion or pumping systems during high water episodes. Um, but it is definitely something that we still need to look into a lot more. Um, and we can't just wait until it is at our front door, like literally, and <laughs> we're all trying to evacuate. So um, yeah, there, there's solutions as far as upstream water, water diversion, pumping systems, but we do need to look at far less expensive solutions as well and stop going to outside contractors. We can probably keep this local at a more affordable um, cost and also support local businesses and keep that money and revenue in our community. Thank you. Okay, I believe everyone got a chance to answer that one. Uh, or, uh, Ms. Did everyone get a chance to answer that? I believe so, okay. So question number five, and this one, our order will be Mr. Blank, Mr. East, Ms. Figueroa and Ms. Garcia Cadena. Um, Number five, what would be your first two priorities to attempt to accomplish within your first year in office? So my first priority is to reopen the small businesses, to communicate with the small businesses ask them what they need from us to reopen safely, Re reopen outdoor dining. Uh, there's nothing unsafe about that scientifically. Uh, we need that to be a, a high priority. I walked down downtown Woodland a couple days ago. It was a ghost town for most of it, except for one restaurant that I believe was uh, in violation of the orders. Um, and it was bustling and it was refreshing to see. Um, second priority, I would uh, say homelessness needs to be addressed. It's a very complicated issue and um, it is sometimes feels like the city wants to protect and advocate for homeless rights over against the right and well-being and safety of the citizens. And a lot of people are really upset with the garbage, with the, with the unsanitation, uh, going to the store with your children. And um, it, it's, it's, it has a, it's a hard conversation to have with your kids. You know, why, why is that person there like that? Um, so continue to address this complicated issue. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. East. Well, the number one problem I think the city is facing at this point is solvency. We're looking at major deficits down the road. We have enough reserves to cover the general fund for one or two years, given the current assumptions that the budget assumes. Um, but you know, we're looking at an $8 million deficit down the road. Uh, within the, like the five-year plan, it's between six and eight, depending on economics. We need to look at what we want, need to do relative to those liabilities. Now, some of it could be fixed in the fact that a lot of it might be employee-related. Um, if, if the stock market continues to perform like it is, a lot of the contribution, the, the contribution to the the pension fund could be reduced. Um, we need to look at, uh, you know, reducing the size of government and perhaps in, in looking at inviting social enterprises, nonprofits. Um, we have several of those in town picking up some of the load. The city doesn't necessarily have to lead in everything. They are there primarily to provide security and prevent mayhem. And we have a great organization, uh, great organizations, nonprofits are doing a lot, perhaps being more reliant on those. Thank you. Ms. Figueroa. Uh, 
Um, so the first two issues and what I feel is most important is um, number one is reopen businesses that without a question needs to happen. Businesses have gone above and beyond to comply with these draconian regulations, rules. They have completely restructured their businesses, modified their policies or procedures, everything they've done from sanitation to placing seats without, um, you know, six feet from each other. And I'm not just talking about outdoor dining. I'm talking about indoor dining, too. I mean, I find it very embarrassing that you can book a plane ticket and sit elbow to elbow next to somebody that's not in your same household, but because you have a mask on, you're quote unquote protected. Um, uh, just, it, it does not sit well with me. Um, every business is essential. If you're working to put food on the table for your family, you are an essential worker. So that is primary what we need to focus on. Um, the second one is definitely crime and homeless. I kind of feel like those issues go hand in hand. The criminal activity in my area specifically has increased. The cops are here all the time. Um, I can't take my dogs out to go to the restroom once it gets dark because I am fearful for my safety. Book and releasing these criminals are is not working. There needs They need to be held accountable for their consequences. We need to figure out a better program or place regardless of COVID being used as the excuse to not be able to hold them at the police station. So that's something that we need to address immediately. Thank you. Ms. Garcia Cadena. Hello, so the first two priorities would be, I agree, assisting our small businesses with recovering from the pandemic. Um, our downtown was really beginning to thrive prior to this COVID crisis and uh, our city economy will definitely suffer if the we lose these small businesses. They, they play a major role. Um, the other <coughs> priority would be youth engagement. Many of our youth have been isolated during this time and their mental health is a concern. And by Engaging our youth, we solve quite a few issues, uh, civic engagement, uh, we can cut down on crime, we can um, just get get our youth involved in what's happening downtown. I think that with so many of them being, or not just downtown, throughout Woodland, so many of them have been stuck at home in their room. I have a 16-year-old uh, and she works out of her room and and... They, the students need to be out and engaged, and that's part of our rebuilding that we'll need to do as soon as we're able to safely gather again. Okay, thank you very much. Well, we have time enough now for the closing statements from our uh, uh, panelists here. So um, let's go ahead and proceed with that. Um, we'll start with Mr. East, Ms. Figueroa, Ms. Garcia Cadena, and Mr. Blank. Again, thank you to the League of Women Voters for sponsoring this forum. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to talk and to meet the other candidates. I think that there have been some very thoughtful and, in, um, and intelligent responses to problems that are being um, recognized in this, the city. Um, I am very proud to be a part of this uh, a good field of people uh, who are all qualified to, to do the role. Um, I look forward to the uh, decision that is made by the city council on the appointment and I will support whatever decision they make. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Ms. Figueroa. Okay, yes. Um, so in District 3 where I live, crime and the homeless population has increased dramatically. While this has happened, the city's lack of transparency has been very apparent. This past month, the Woodland Police Department was present every single day in my neighborhood for break-ins, vandalism, destruction of property, 
drug-related activity, and much more. But the whole town does not know about this increasing problem. The homeless problem has elevated to a level that cannot be ignored. New homeless camps are seen daily. When they are cleaned up, the problem is just relocated, providing no real solution. The new homeless shelter adjacent to District 4 will not resolve any of these issues as it will only provide shelter for 40 of the 350 homeless in town, but will do nothing to address the drug and criminal behavior of repeat individuals who refuse to get help. This has become a matter of health and safety. This is why I am applying for this position and I am so passionate about helping our city. Thank you. Ms. Garcia Cadena. Hello, thank you. Yes, I wanna thank the, the league for hosting this event. And I would just like to reiterate that I did run for this uh, seat a couple of years ago and I did go door to door representing district three um, is something that I've wanted to do. I have been around the neighborhoods. I've listened to residents and I earned many other votes. Um, I have earned the respect of my peers and my community members by cultivating relationships throughout Woodland as well as Yolo County. And my community involvement and leadership skills have prepared me to be the best candidate to represent District 3 on the Woodland City Council. I have the experience and the drive to be a positive force on the council. I'm the person who will work to find and implement solutions to our problems. My record of success in all of my service to the community is a testament to my commitment to serve the people of Woodland and specifically to represent District 3. Thank you. Mr. Blank. My thanks as well to the league. Um, very much appreciate this forum. Get the chance to meet you and the uh, introduce myself to the community. District three is is different than much of Woodland. Uh, uh, if you walk around District three, you'll see a lot of uh, dead lawns. Lawns, actually, I should say no lawns. People can't afford to have a lawn in District three. A lot of people, a quarter of the the, the lawns in my neighborhood are are not there. Um, multi, you know, people, multiple families in one house. We are struggling financially. Uh, I, I bring to the city council my experience uh, as an advocate for taxpayers. I would advocate for the citizens of District Three and for the wood for the community at large. And I um, hope to have that opportunity. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I want to express my appreciation to each one of you. I think uh, the viewers have had the opportunity to hear um, a lot of very thoughtful answers to their questions. And um, again, I appreciate your being here. I also want to thank the viewers for their involvement and um, uh, some excellent questions coming in. And to remind you that um, there are ways that you can contact your city council. Um, if you, and I have them up here on the screen, you can uh, go to the city council uh, page on the city of Woodland website, and then you can submit a uh, written message to the council in that manner. Or you can uh, make public comment during the general public comment section um, or on a specific agenda item at city council meetings. And those instructions are also on your uh, city council or your city of Woodland website. So um, again, thank you all for your participation and um, uh, good night.